Okay, so let's get started. So this is MSE 498. So if anybody's um, in MSE 498 is missing a computer, let me know. Everybody's good. Okay, so if you're not in the class, you're welcome to stick around as long as you're, you're not making too much noise or whatever. Great, all right, so let me pass around the attendance sheet. Um, okay, so just as a quick reminder, tonight, 11.59 p.m., you have three deliverables. You have quiz number one, you have your batch project, and you have your MATLAB project. So submit those via Compass. Um, if Compass is playing up, you're having any problems, you can send them to me via email, that's fine. Um, and don't leave it to the last minute because, um, you know, there's always technical problems at the last second. So just leave yourself a good amount of time to get, get the submission done. Um, okay, so are you looking for a workstation? So who is in this room that is not an MSD 498? Okay, an empty workstation there, we're good. Okay, so, um, Let's pick up where we left off last time. And so we were just getting to the end of the theory lecture on DFT. And so the whole idea was I wanted to introduce you to the rudiments of quantum mechanics for the folks that weren't familiar with that, uh, because we sort of need to know what theory is actually being applied in the code that we're going to run next week. And so I said, don't worry if you don't get all the minutiae of this thing. Um, I just want you to get the general thread of, you know, the basics of density functional theory. Um, and what you're going to start, start controlling in your code. And so the practice lecture, which we'll get to in just uh, once we finish up these next few slides, is start digging in a little deeper into, okay, what buttons do I actually press? What knobs do I actually control when I'm running a DFT calculation? Um, but nevertheless, let's finish up the theory. And so if you remember, we started with the Schrodinger equation, and we said if we could solve this analytically, we wouldn't have to ever do any density functional theory, but it gets way too complicated way too quickly when you're worried about sort of more than one electron. And so then we said, well, let's make some approximations. And so then we went through the Hartree approximation, which is sort of uncorrelated electrons. And we said, okay, that's problematic if you're not worrying about correlation. Then we did Hartree Fox, which sort of builds in a little bit more correlation in the sense that the Pauli exclusion principle is obeyed. And we said, that gets you so far, but then it becomes very expensive for very large systems. And so then we did something called density functional theory, where we said, let's not worry about the hugely high dimensional wave function that has the coordinates of every single electron in our system, let's solve everything just in terms of a density, which is the three dimensional function. And so we showed that we could solve the um, Schrodinger equation basically for the density. And this, we said the way that we're gonna do that is use the Cohn-Sham equation. And so that's where we sort of left off. And we said that that's what's actually implemented in your DFT code we're gonna run next week. Um, and so then we started talking about things that we can tune within that code, and we'll dig into that a little bit deeper in just a second. And we said you can worry about things like what exchange correlation functional that you pick. That was the big problem. We said that with sacrificing all of the multidimensional wave function and going to a density-only description, we have this unknown term that's really horrible that's the exchange correlation, and we need to fix that up. And we said, well, David separately told us how to do that with a local density approximation. And then we said we need to worry about some other things like pseudo-potentials and the basis set. Okay, so that was sort of where we got to last time. And so that, that was the, the end of the slide deck last time. So let's just finish that out. And so we started talking about using plane waves to represent things in a metal. And so we said plane waves are a good choice in extended systems um, because these waves are sort of formally infinite. And so we can use them and build up a basis set and develop some interference patterns. And we can start to localize the wave function on top of the atoms. This looks pretty promising. And that's, that's the basis set that we're gonna use um, if, if you're looking at an extended metal, if you're looking at molecules, you typically pick a Gaussian basis set because you want things to be nice and localized. Okay, and so if I go back just a few slides. Yep, so right here, what we said was that we actually solve the exchange correlation part, which is our local density approximation or the generalized gradient approximation or whatever you want to pick for that, and the external potential, so sort of the ion potential. Um, in real space. But we said it's actually more efficient to solve for the kinetic energy, so that del squared part, and the Hartree energy, which was that Coulombic repulsion between electrons in reciprocal space. And so we're never actually going to have to worry too much about the details of reciprocal space other than just a couple of points. Um, so first of all, for folks that are not familiar, what the heck is a reciprocal space? So perhaps just the easiest way to understand it is that if you're looking at a crystal, there's a fundamental crystalline unit cell. And that unit cell can just be translated through all of space and it's sort of translationally invariant and you can replicate to make your crystal. So like the unit cell of aluminum crystal or the unit cell of a sodium chloride crystal. It just contains a small number of atoms and if we want to build an infinite crystal, we just translate that guy through space. Okay, so not, not too difficult. 
Um, and so that's what we were saying with uh, if we have a periodic system, the way we write our wave function is to have some plane waves and then to have this sort of translation operator that makes sure that your wave function looks the same at every unit cell throughout your infinite crystal. Okay, so if we're solving stuff in reciprocal space, it basically means you're solving things in Fourier space. And so has anyone heard of Fourier transforms before? Okay, a couple of people. And so if this doesn't really make too much sense, you don't worry about it. Actually, you need to know very little in order to run the code. Um, but let me try and give you a flavor for what's actually happening here. And so we can represent a function, any function. So let's just draw a function. Perhaps it looks something like this. Um, okay, and so this is x, and this is f of x. So just some function. And so it turns out that you can represent this function in some basis set. And so maybe that basis set could be sines and cosines. And so you can pick a basis set. It's got really long sine waves. And it's got really high frequency sine waves. And so you can write this function f of x Uh, let me make this k. That's just a linear combination of sine waves. And so maybe your function contains some slowly varying modes, and so the slow sine waves will contribute a lot. Maybe it contains a couple of higher varying modes, and so there'll be a couple of faster sine waves in there. And so this is basically the essence of a Fourier decomposition. And so it's saying we can represent this wave using a product, uh, using a sum of sine waves. So, so nothing more than that. And so it turns out it's a similar idea um, it, when, when we're doing DFT. And so basically what we do is that we say we can represent our wave function using sort of a sum of sine waves. That's, that's a nice thing to do. And it looks something like this. And actually these waves exist in this new space, this Fourier space. And so if this is our original crystal, we have our fundamental simulation cell, our fundamental crystal lattice in real space, and we also have a fundamental crystal lattice in reciprocal space. So you switch over to the Fourier representation and then you study your system in this new reciprocal space. So basically what we're saying is that we don't have to worry about the infinite space, we just have to worry about a little chunk of it. And so that'll make more sense when we start talking about K sampling um, in the next few slides. But basically I just want you to understand there's a real space lattice, there's a reciprocal space lattice, and we only need to worry about a tiny little chunk of that lattice because we have a periodic system. So, so that's all that we're saying there. Um, okay, and so if you can solve your, uh, your DFC uh, simulation, you will get a bunch of wave functions. And so we remember that the wave functions we're actually solving for under the Cohn-Sham approximation are there's these independent electron wave functions. And so we said the smart way to solve these equations is to do what Cohn-Sham said and solve for each electron living in its own little wave function. And we fix up the interaction between them using the exchange correlation functional. And so what we can do is that we can solve for the wave function for each little electron. And so that's what I'm trying to show in this plot here. So this is known as the band structure of a crystal. Um, and so if you're a material scientist working in electronic materials, you'll worry a lot about this thing. And so, so let me try and explain what exactly this is. So this is the little chunk of reciprocal space that we have to worry about. And so it's living in this so-called wigner size uh, crystal in the real space or the Bruyne zone in the reciprocal space. Bruyne zone in the reciprocal space just means the little chunk of space that you need to worry about. We don't need to worry about wave functions outside that because we have periodic um, systems. And so it turns out that the way um, folks who do DFT like to describe this space is to pick out special points in it with very high symmetry. And so right in the origin, there's the gamma point. You move along here, there's a sigma point. Up here, there's the, uh, the uh, lambda point. And so it's just basically a convention that says, how does the wave function change as you move along these special points of high symmetry? So it's just special high symmetry points. There, there's nothing scary about it. It's just that that's the convention. And so what we can then do is trace along these special high symmetry points and ask, well, what does my wave function look like for each electron? So what's my Kuhn-Sham wave function for each electron? And so let's take the lowest energy one. And so as you trace along those special high symmetry points, this is what the wave function looks like. This is the energy 
as a function of these special high symmetry points, so the energy of that electron according to the wave function that we compute for it as you move along this little path in this reciprocal space. Then there's the next most energetic electron, which sort of has a, a profile band structure that looks like this, and so on and so forth. And so why is this plot interesting? This plot is actually really interesting because it tells us for this system, which is actually copper, there's no energy gap between the electrons. And so there's no point that we can draw a horizontal line where there can be no electron at that particular energy. And so that's important because it tells us that electrons can very easily move up and down in energy, and that's exactly what you should expect for a metal. And so metals, the electrons are free, they can flow very easily, there's high conductivity, and it's exactly the opposite from what you should expect for a semiconductor, where there is going to be a band gap. There's going to be a little piece of energy where no electron can possibly exist. It's just forbidden by the, by the structure of the system. And so we can exploit that band gap to like absorb radiation uh, in solar cells, or you can use it in light emitting diodes to have your, your system sort of emit radiation. And so we'll discuss that in just one second. And so actually in your project, you're going to study aluminum, and you're going to try and show that there's no band gap in aluminum because it's a metal. Um, if you were to study silicon, you would find a band gap because it's a semiconductor. And so DFT can be, can be very powerful in predicting band gaps. And we'll discuss that more in, in just one second. So I know this seems pretty complicated. It's sort of a weird thing to do. But basically, just think about two points. Number one, we're solving a little chunk of space. We need to worry about high symmetry points in that space because that's the interesting places we need to worry about. And if you trace a path along those high symmetry points, you can predict the energy of each electron, and that will give you the band structure. Um, OK, so any questions about that? I know it's a little strange if you've never seen this before. So you'll get some practice in this in your project. If it didn't make sense the first time, uh, hopefully it'll make sense the second time. Yeah, question. It's just a convention, so it, it just always follows in, in this order. And so it's just the natural way of writing it down. If, uh, if you work in the field, you'll expect to see them in a particular order, and that's the, that's the way people do it. There's no deep reason for it, as far as I know. OK, so um, let's just finish up last couple of slides. So successes and failures of DFT. Um, so DFT does a really good job at some things, and it does a pretty bad job at other things. And so it's important to appreciate where it performs well and where it performs poorly. OK, so it does really well at predicting lattice parameters, so spacing between atoms in a crystal. And so from first principles, you can predict um, the bond length in hydrogen or the lattice constant in an aluminum crystal. And you can have pretty high confidence it's going to agree very well with the experiment. And so that's a nice feature of DFT. It tends to do that very well. It gets bulk modulus within about 10%. So if you're worried about what happens when you stretch a crystal, sort of Young's modulus or shear moduli or things like this, um, it usually gets that within about 10%. So, so that's pretty good. Um, it also gets sort of forces on atoms um, within about 10, 5 or 10%, and vibrational frequencies within about 5 or 10%. So if you're worried about phonons in your crystal, it does a pretty good job. It also does pretty well with defect energy. So it gets defect. So if you were to add an atom to your crystal, put it in an interstitial site, or remove an atom from your crystal, it gets those within about 0.1 electron volts, which is not too bad. There are certain cases where it performs pretty badly, uh, but they tend to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, OK, where it doesn't do so good is excited states. And so we had a question last time, uh, which was basically, everything you're computing is ground state. How about if you need to worry about excited states? Um, so there are ways of convincing your DFT calculation to compute an excited state. Um, it's a little more complicated. We're not going to do it in this class, but it, but it is possible. Quantum Espresso, which is the software package we're going to use, does support that. But it turns out the estimates are usually pretty bad. Um, and so local density approximation is terrible. It doesn't predict excited state very well at all. So you need to use a more complicated exchange correlation functional. And band gaps are usually underestimated by like 20 or 50 percent. And so this is a big problem, because if you're using DFT and you want to try and design a brand new semiconductor to make the world's greatest solar cell, the band gaps it predicts, which are sort of an important feature of your semiconductor, the most important feature of your semiconductor, um, are tend to be underestimated. And so there are ways of fixing this up, but that's an important thing to appreciate. Um, OK, and so the way you can fix it up is to take better exchange correlation functionals. So let's see that in action. 
So this is immediately applicable to what you're going to be doing in your project, which is what happens to my DSD calculation as I change one of the dials that I have control over, uh, this particular dial being the exchange correlation functional that you pick, so how you treat this exchange correlation. So we're studying indium arsenide, which is an important semiconductor. It has what's known as a direct band gap. Um, so there are two sort of qualitatively different band gaps. And so if this is my, um, let's just draw some high symmetry points. If this is my energy, so I have some band structure like this. So there exists a particular energy at which I can draw a horizontal line and no electron can exist. So this material does contain a band gap and it's a direct band gap because the smallest gap occurs at precisely the same point in K space. So along this high symmetry path that we drew, this is a direct band gap material. And why that is important is, and this is going a little deeper than we really need to in this class, is that it means the momentum of the electron does not need to change as it jumps from here to here, and that means it can actually be promoted by absorbing a photon. And so that means that you can irradiate the system with light, and photons of precisely the correct energy will cause electrons to jump. So that's great if you're trying to make a solar cell. So it turns out that um, silicon, so indium arsenide and gallium arsenide are both direct band gas materials. It turns out that silicon is an indirect band gas. And so you can again draw horizontal lines, but the point at which the smallest gap exists, so jumping from here to here, requires a change in momentum of the electron. So it means it's less efficient at absorbing photons. It turns out that it's a very inefficient process for the photon to promote this electron because the electron has to change momentum. That's just what quantum mechanics tells us. And this is an indirect band gap material. So that's, that's an important uh, distinction to make. And so when you're designing solar cells, typically you want direct band gaps. And that's why gallium arsenide and indium arsenide are better in principle than silicon, but they're much more expensive and they contain some materials problems. Um, and so that's actually why solar cells are made out of silicon, because it's, although it's less efficient, it actually has some other benefits. Okay, so that's a little bit of an aside. Nevertheless, let's study indium arsenide using DFT. So this is a known direct band gap material. If we were to um, study this using the local density approximation, it turns out that there's no gap. And so DFT would tell us, no, this is not a direct band gap material. There's no place you can draw a horizontal line where no electron can exist. So that's actually a problem. So if we go to a more complicated exchange correlation functional, say PBE, um, it does a little bit better. The band structure looks a little bit more like uh, what's found experimentally, but again, it predicts no gap. It turns out you have to go all the way to this very complicated, much more um, sort of sophisticated exchange correlation functional called B3LYP, and it predicts a band gap of 0.54 electron volts, uh, which is close, but not sort of bang on to the experimental band gap. And so if you use this exchange correlation functional, you find that you do have a direct band gap material. Yes. So I am exactly the wrong person to ask about this, but in principle, there are experimental ways to find the band structure of a material. Um, so you can actually make plots like this from experiments. More commonly, which is an easier experiment to do, is to figure out what the band gap is. And I think that's a much easier experiment because basically you can just figure out what energy photons can be absorbed or emitted by the material. So you can then compute what that little gap has got to be. Um, the short answer is really you can look up a materials handbook and a lot of these things for the common semiconductor materials will just be listed there. But it's sort of, it's sort of really cool to me that you can generate band structure plots like this from experiments, uh, which is sort of interesting, and compare them directly to DFT. Um, yeah, so good question. So this sort of begs the question, well, how do I know what exchange correlation functional to use? And so really the only answer is you have to compare to experiment if it exists. That's sort of the gold standard way of doing it. Um, if the experiments do not exist, typically what folks do is take more and more complex exchange correlation functionals and see where you sort of converge. And so if you get the same answer between LDE and PDE, maybe you're pretty convinced that you're doing an okay job. But if those answers are very different, like we see here, you may say, well, I need to go more complicated. I need to pick a better exchange correlation functional and see where you sort of saturate. 
to where you converge your band structure. Um, okay, so you can use more complicated exchange correlation functionals, B3LYP or HSE, to do a better job, or you can pick a different method entirely. And so we said, well, maybe you need to go beyond DFT. And so one method beyond DFT is quantum Monte Carlo, which was how separately and Alder um, computed those LDA parameters, was to say, let's forget about DFT, let's go to a much more complicated, more exact methodology that's much, much more expensive. So if your system is small enough, you can treat it with quantum Monte Carlo, maybe that's something you want to do. Or you can use the so-called GW approximation, which is basically a green function expansion of the Coulomb energy that's truncated at a particular point. It's a completely different um, methodology from DFT, but it turns out it gives a little better answers. So we're never going to do this, but I think I want to make you aware that you can go beyond DFT. DFT is sort of the workhorse that most folks use in the field, but there are more complicated, more expensive methods. So let me show you here the predictions for the band gap um, using DFT with the local density approximation, so these empty triangles. Um, the GW approximation, which is sort of post-DFT methodology with these empty squares, and then the experimental results. And so if you look through this plot for all of these materials, we see that DFT using the local density approximation chronically underestimates the band gap. And so these little triangles are always to the left of the experimental results. If you want to do a better job, you might do something like the GW approximation. And a lot of cases, that lands bang on top of the experiment. And so maybe if you're worried about semiconductors, you're doing semiconductor design for a living, um, and your system is small enough, maybe you want to use GW rather than DFT. So DFT is not a panacea for everything. Sometimes you need to use something a little more complicated. OK, so just to summarize, using density functional theory to make predictions. You can use the local density approximation, which is sort of your, your first choice because it's nice and simple. You will get lattice constants within about 1%, which is great. You get cohesive energies within about 5 to 20%, and bulk moduli within sort of 5 to 10. Um, but your band gaps are pretty bad. So this just means transition metals. So it turns out bulk modulus is the worst for late transition metals. So if you know you're interested in late transition metals, you need to worry about that. If you're not interested in late transition metals, maybe you're OK. So what's the next most complicated thing you can do? You can do GGA, so generalized gradient approximation for your exchange correlation functional. That improves your cohesive energy, so it's better for lattice parameters. And it turns out that's an important thing to use for magnetic systems. If you need to get even more complicated, you might have to pick a hybrid functional. Band gaps are better, often pretty accurate. But if you need to go even more complicated, you're going to have to go to a different methodology, so GW or quantum Monte Carlo. OK, and this is just what I said uh, a second ago. So you should always check the accuracy of your methodology against the experiment if it exists, or failing that against more accurate theory. So that's just the best thing you can do if those experimental data are, are not available. OK, so that was our 30,000 foot overview of, of DFT. So um, like I said, if you didn't get everything, that's OK. But hopefully you have enough understanding of the theory that what we're actually going to do when we um, run quantum espresso to do some calculations makes sense. So that, that was really the goal of this. Okay, so any questions on, on this stuff? Okay, so let's, uh, let's get on to actually how we put this into practice. Okay, so quantum mechanics practice using quantum espresso. So what is quantum espresso and, and why are we using it? So there are sort of a slew of DSC packages available. Um, so I just wanted to list some of them here. You may be familiar with some of them. You may be less familiar with some of them. Uh, the one that we're using is quantum espresso. Why are we using it? Well, it's actually a pretty good package. It's uh, also free, which is very important for us. It turns out you can spend as much money as you want buying um, DSC software. For example, that sort of costs $3,000 for a license. Uh, Win 2K is sort of 500. So important for sort of learning and sort of using in a class environment needs to be free. It turns out that it's also actually a very good package. And so it has a user support base, which is very large. People are constantly contributing to it and error checking it and making sure that it runs really nicely. Um, and it's also very friendly to use. And so I just listed here sort of the dif different functionalities in each of these packages. Quantum Espresso supports plane wave DFT, pseudo-potentials, ultra-soft pseudo-potentials, and this thing we're not actually going to use, but is important if you want to do any large calculations called projector-augmented wave. Uh, 
Um, and so if you're using these packages in your research, you're going to want to figure out uh, whether it supports the features you're going to need to answer the questions you, you want to answer. And so a lot of times DFT uh, can be done to pretty, pretty high quality in most systems that you'd be interested in using a free package such as Quantum Espresso. Okay, so this is what it looks like. I'm assuming this is meant to be either a wave function or a coffee stain because it's called Quantum Espresso. Um, I don't know, and I think this is like I and H bar. So I guess it's got a cute logo. Okay, and so Quantum Espresso is an integrated suite of, of open source computer codes used for electronic structure calculations and materials modeling at nanoscale. So let's just sort of the boilerplate that Quantum Espresso say about themselves. Um, but what's sort of important here is that it, it does consist of a whole bunch of different codes that do different things. And so the one that we're going to use is going to be doing plane wave DFT, but maybe if you're worried about doing excited state calculations, you're going to need to use something called like a YAMBO package, which is another little executable that comes with Quantum Espresso. Um, and so what I'm going to try and do in the next couple of slides very briefly is just illustrate all of the functionality of Quantum Espresso so that you know what it can do. So maybe down the road you want to come back and do a phonon calculation and you want to see if Quantum Espresso can actually do that for you. Um, okay, it's fundamentally built on plane waves and so we saw that we had sort of two choices for our basis set. We could do Gaussians or we could do plane waves. Um, Gaussians are a good choice for molecules because they're nice and localized. Plane waves are a good choice for extended systems like metals. So it turns out the Quantum Espresso is sort of designed with plane waves because it's sort of built to do extended systems. You can actually do molecules with plane waves. It's sort of less efficient, but it is possible. And we're actually going to study the hydrogen molecule as our walkthrough next week using plane waves, um, and, and it will turn out to give us very nice answers. Okay, and so there are a bunch of more complicated tasks um, that the Quantum Espresso can do. There's the Quantum Espresso Foundation, which is based in Italy, but it's really worldwide. Um, it's contributed to developers across the globe. It's open source and free, which is great if you actually want to go in and start modifying the source code. And there are lots of actually free workshops. Uh, I'm not sure if they're free actually, but there are workshops put on often in very nice places like Trieste in Italy. So if you're interested in learning more about Quantum Espresso and you can convince your advisor to send you to Italy, you could attend a Quantum Espresso workshop. Okay, so how is its performance? Uh, small jobs, so few atoms. And so that's not as restrictive as it sounds, because we remember if we're studying an extended crystal, all we need to worry about is the little Wigner site fundamental crystal and cell that's translationally replicated through all space. And so that probably consists of only a few atoms. So if your unit cell is pretty small, quantum espresso can actually just run on the workstation in front of you. And actually, when we study aluminum, um, the unit cell contains one atom, uh, because we make the cell in a smart way. And so it will run very, very quickly on, on these workstations. Um, if you're doing bigger jobs, so your unit cell is a lot larger, you can use OpenMP parallelization, so dump it over a bunch of cores and make it run a lot quicker. If you're doing seriously big jobs and you have access to a Linux cluster, you can use MPI parallelism, which is another form of parallelism, to scale it up to thousands of cores. Um, and the scaling is actually pretty good. And so as far as these packages go, you're actually getting a lot of bang for your buck per core that you run it on. Um, and actually, very recently, a GPU-enabled version came out. So if you have fast graphics cards on your, um, on your workstations, like a lot of modern, uh, modern processors, processing systems do, you can actually run it on the, on the GPU. The documentation is great. Um, it's all documented nicely up here at this link. Um, there are mailing lists and forums. And so if you, if you have a question that's not immediately answered in the documentation, you can often go to the forum or indeed just Google for the question, um, and it will pop up. Perhaps somebody's answered it and posted it to this list. And there are a bunch of tutorials. And so obviously we're going to do a walkthrough together. Uh, but if you're interested in doing more complex things or you want to do another tutorial, you can go to this link and there'll be a sort of step-by-step -step guide of how to study a particular system using Quantum Espresso. So it's a very well supported tool. Okay, so like I said, it's free. So you can download it from either here or here. Um, if you're running a Linux system, you can actually download, download the binaries directly from Debian. Um, and it's supported on a lot of platforms. And so actually all the three common operating systems um, has, have Quantum Espresso support. So Mac, Windows, via Sigwin, um, and of course Linux. And so these are sort of the requirements. At the minimum, you're going to need a Fortran and a C compiler. Um, if you want to do parallel runs, you're going to need MPI. You're going to need Make. You're going to need Lafayette and Blast. And you're going to need FFT libraries to do the reciprocal space calculations. So if none of that makes sense to you, don't worry about it because I've installed it for your use on these workstations. So you can just access the executable directly. But if you want to install it yourself, it is available um, and it could be a fun thing to do to try and get this running on your, on your machine at home.
So what does the user guide look like? It's super friendly, and so you can fill up this uh, this page. It's got this nice sort of hyperlinked documentation, and so you can jump to the section that you're interested in and find out um, find out more about the the uh, problem that you need to solve. Um, there's also a nice installation guide, and so if you want to have a shot at installing this yourself, um, there's sort of step by step instructions, and also looking on the forums can help you out. It's sort of painful just because there's so many moving pieces, um, but it, but it, 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 it does work. And so if you just run through exactly the instructions that, that are written up here and pick the system that you have, everything should, should run okay. Um, and parallel performance. And so if you have access to a Linux cluster or you have a machine at home with multi-cores, you can run it over multiple cores. Um, and so you can find out a little bit more about that there. So this is a big deal for um, DFT calculations in particular is the parallel performance because things scale so horribly with the number of electrons. I think it's like usually quartic. And so the CPU time goes up like the fourth power of the number of electrons that you have. Having good parallel performance is really important to solve decent sized systems. Okay, so let me just run very quickly over what can Quantum Espresso do. And so only sort of really the first couple slides are gonna to apply to things that we need it to do, but I just want to give you an appreciation for down the road what more advanced features it has. So basically we do ground state calculations and structural optimization, and those are the two things that we're gonna worry about in this class. You can also worry about transition states, uh, minimum energy paths for sort of transitions between different structures. And you can actually also do ab initio molecular dynamics. This is kind of cool. Uh, basically you use a DFT calculation to compute the forces on all of your ions um, caused by the particular electronic configuration that you have, and then you move your ions forward one step in time and then recompute the electronic structure around that new position, and then recompute the forces on your on your ions and move them forward another step in time. And so that's known as ab initio molecular dynamics because there are no sort of free parameters. You're basically moving the nuclei in your system according to the forces they experience due to the electrons that orbit them. So it's known as um, can be called par parallelo or ab initio molecular dynamics. You can uh, compute response properties, so how your system responds to sort of irradiation by light or various other things using basically a perturbation theory approach, the density functional perturbation theory. You can also compute spectra and quantum transport. Um, so Andre Schleifer, who's one of the material science faculty, he worries a lot about computing spectroscopic properties and the transport of uh, electrons in, in quantum materials. Um, Okay, so what are we basically going to do? So let's look at the first, the first bullet point there, which is ground state calculation. And so we can self-consistently, remembering that the Cohn-Shan approach is a self-consistent approach, meaning you have to iterate around until your density converges. Uh, we can compute the total energies, forces, and stresses. We can get the electronic orbitals, which means that we can get the band structure. Um, quantum espresso supports a bunch of different pseudopotentials, ultra soft so-called, or not norm conserving. And so there's a whole slew of pseudopotentials we can pick from. Similarly, there's a whole slew of exchange correlation functionals, meaning that we can pick, if we're worried about it, these more advanced ones in order to get band gaps a little better. And we can also actually add in van der Waals corrections. Um, and so one of the things uh, DFT doesn't do very well is sort of van der Waals forces, and so there's some corrections you can add in for that. And if you're worried about um, conducting scintillating transitions, you can also add in the so-called Hubbard U model, if that's something that you're worried about. Um, so we're going to compute the ground state um, electronic structure for a couple of systems, for a hydrogen molecule and for the aluminum crystal. And we're also going to do some structural optimization. And so basically you can compute the electronic structure for a particular arrangement of ions. And then you can compute the forces on the ions. And if those forces are non-zero, it means your system is going to want to relax to a lower energy state. And so Quantum Espresso can do that for you. So imagine you designed a brand new crystal and you screwed up the lattice parameter, all your atoms were packed too closely together. Quantum Espresso could tell you that your atoms are actually experiencing forces and you're gonna to have to relax the lattice constant to allow the crystal to reach its equilibrium state. And it can do that using some smart sort of gradient descent. Um, and so we're actually gonna do that to compute the equilibrium bond length for the hydrogen molecule, pretending that we didn't know what the bond length was to kind of predict that from first principles. That's kind of a cool thing to be able to do. Um, Okay, if you're worried about transition states, it supports something called the nudge elastic band and method dynamics. And if you're worried about ab initio molecular dynamics, like we discussed before, it also supports that. So these are just extra features we're not actually going to use. 
Um, if you're doing spectra, you can compute X-ray spectra, you can compute electronic excitations using the so-called YAMBO package or, or using the GWL package. And if you're worried about quantum transport, so how things move around in a quantum material, it also supports it through these various other modules here. And so you would just call different portions of the quantum espresso package to do these calculations for you if that was the sort of thing you were interested in. Okay. So essentially very um, portable, and so it runs on almost every conceal conceivable um, workstation architecture. So anything that you might have at home or in this room, it will run on. It runs on very large parallel machines very efficiently. So Blue Waters, I believe people may be running Quantum Espresso on Blue Waters. It's certainly supported on these sort of Cray um, type chips. Um, and it also supports uh, clusters of various, various connectivities. If you have nice InfiniBand connections between all of your nodes that allow for very fast communication, Quantum Espresso can exploit that very well. And indeed, like we mentioned, it also runs on graphics processing units. And so if you have an old PlayStation at home with a fast graphics processor on it, you can actually run it on that. And you can indeed run it on your cell phone. And so I'm assuming you can only do very small systems, but for whatever reason, Quantum Espresso decided to support uh, running on cell phone architectures. So if you have a spare afternoon and you're bored, you can try and download Quantum Espresso and get it to run on your iPhone. Let me know if you do that. That would be really cool. There may be extra credit for that. Um, Okay, so that's just the overview. So just giving you a flavor for what Quantum Espresso is and what it can do. So how do we actually run this? So performing a DFT calculation requires basically determining where the atoms are, so where the ion nuclei are, and what quantities you want to calculate. So you need to set up your system, and you need to figure out what question are you asking of your system. So in this class, we're going to ask, what does your electronic density look like? Um, and we're going to ask, what does your equilibrium lattice constant or bond length look like? And so that's going to inform what parts of quantum espresso we're actually going to use. But there's a lot of control over the approximations. And so that's really the big deal that I'm going to try and convey to you in this walkthrough and in the project that we do. It's how you control the approximations. So like we said, if we could solve the Schrodinger equation directly, we wouldn't need to worry about all this stuff. But because we can't, the approximations we use are really important. And the way you pick your approximations has to be done in a rational and a logical way, and you have to understand what changing each of these approximations is going to do to your system. That was why we went through all the pain of the theory, because if you pick the local density approximation for your exchange correlation functional, you're probably not going to get a very good band structure. You need to understand that changing that will give you a better band structure. Or if you're trying to simulate um, using pseudo-potentials, you need to figure out how you're actually going to use these pseudo-potentials to allow your simulation to speed up by sort of implicitly accounting for the core electrons and what implications that has for your calculation. Um, and so basically what I want to run through here are what the um, approximations we make are and how we control them. Okay, so this is probably the most important sentence in this, in this entire slide deck, that all DFT calculations begin with convergence analysis and error estimation. And the asterisk says all DFT calculations that are worth anything will have these things built in. And so this is very important because you want to know that your calculation is converged with respect to the approximations that you make. And so the way that you define your beta set or the way that you do your reciprocal space sampling, um, these all need to be converged. Otherwise, you don't have any faith that your answer is, is sort of meaningful. And so we're going to go through that uh, right now. So verification, are you computing the right mathematics and does your calculation match experiment? And so those are sort of the two ways of error checking your results. Okay, so why did we go through all the pain of BASH, as I'm sure you're doing right now? You're um, hating me for this BASH project that I gave you. The reason we did the BASH project is because Quantum Espresso and actually LAMPS, which is the next uh, software package we're going to use, are both command line based. And so you need to have some competency in BASH in order to get these guys to run. And this is what a Quantum Espresso output looks like. And so this is a particular simulation that I ran. It spits out sort of nice stuff to the BASH terminal and tries to format it in some reasonable way. Um, and so it is an, uh, an intrinsically command line based tool. There's no GUI as far as I know for Quantum Espresso. So how do we actually run it? Well, basically you write a nice input script and through the walkthrough we're going to discuss how you write an input script to Quantum Espresso. An input script is going to tell Quantum Espresso what your system looks like and what you want it to calculate. Um, you also then need to provide it with some extra stuff, basically uh, pseudo-potential files, um, and then it will produce some output. And so it will write to the screen the results of your calculation, which is basically what I showed in the last slide. And it will also write some ancillary stuff um, in case you're worried about what the wave function actually looks like, the cone sham wave functions. They will come down in one particular file. 
And then within this um, subdirectory called save, we'll also have charge density, some um, eigenvalues at K points, some more complicated stuff you may want to worry about, which we're not really going to touch. Mainly just the standard output to the screen is the stuff that we're going to be interested in. So how do you run it? So this is the second most important line in this entire slide deck, that if you uh, were asleep for basically the last two lectures and you wanted to run a quantum espresso um, job, this is all you really need to do. And so you call the executable, you feed the executable your input script, and then you spit out your executable's um, output either to the screen, in which case you would omit, omit this, or to a file. And so that would be the, the output file. So this should actually be an N. It's meant to be input, so INP. And so this is the plain wave executable for Quantum Espresso. This is all the details of the simulation that Quantum Espresso needs to know in order to run. And this is the output. This is the, the result of your calculation. So the wave functions, the energies, all that stuff that we want to understand, the, the uh, electronic density. Um, OK, and so it's good practice to output it to a file, because typically you want to save your output. You don't want it just to dump to the screen, and then as soon as you turn off your computer, it's lost. And so typically, that's, that's a good thing to do. OK, so any questions so far? OK, so the main point of today was to talk about the convergence criteria. Um, because that's going to be basically the most of the stuff that we worry about in our walkthrough and in our project. Is our, we computed an answer, but are we converged? Is our answer meaningful? Okay, and so there are basically four or five, depending on how you count them, and I'll summarize them at the end, things that we can control. So the first thing that we can control is what exchange correlation functional we pick. So in our input script, there's going to be a line somewhere that says, okay, quantum espresso, I want you to use the local density approximation. Or, okay, quantum espresso, I want you to use the B3LYP exchange correlation functional. And so we talked a lot about the local density approximation if we want to go beyond that. So treating stuff not as just a uniform electron gas, they go a little bit more complicated. We can use generalized gradient, meta generalized gradient uh, approximation, which basically worries about second derivatives, or go through these more complicated hybrid functionals, so B3LYP or HSE. So if you're doing a band gap calculation, you might want to be down here. If you're just doing sort of electronic structure and a small molecule, maybe you want to be up here. So it's your choice. And you will see as you switch out these different functionals, the quantum espresso will take longer or shorter to run based on how complicated these things are. And so if, you, if you're worried about studying really large systems, maybe at some point you have to make a trade-off. that you say, well, I just can't use such a complex functional because it's going to take long, too long to run my system. And so there are sort of physical, um, sort of practical reasons why you might also pick one over the other. Okay, so that's one thing we control. That's the first dial we control. What exchange correlation functional are we using? We know that we don't know the exact functional form for this, so we have to make an approximation. So you have to pick how you make that approximation. Okay, pseudo-potential. So we talked about this last time also, that we said that if your system consists of uh, sort of very large atoms that have lots of electrons, it's only all the action is really confined to the valence electrons. That's where all the chemistry, all the bonding, all the stuff is happening. The core electrons are just sitting there orbiting the nucleus, not doing very much. And so maybe we don't want to burn a bunch of CPU cycles just telling us what we already know, so these electrons aren't doing anything except sitting there orbiting the nucleus. Um, so maybe we want to sort of implicitly capture them using a pseudo potential. So lump together the ion core, the protons and the neutrons, with the core electrons and have this sort of effective nucleus. And so using that effective nucleus, we can smooth out what our um, ion external potential looks like. So if we were just to have bare ion cores, they would look like this dashed blue line. With a pseudo potential, you get this much smoother, nicer function, which means that you can converge your wave functions much quicker. They are much less highly variable in the core region, and you get nice smooth wave functions. Um, OK, so what approximation are we making? We're taking the true columbic potential of the ion, and we're treating it implicitly accompanied with its core electrons to make this sort of pseudo potential right here. So that means we know we're going to screw up our wave function in the core region, but we also know our wave function is going to be good in the valence region, which is where we care about it. Yes, question. Are those pseudo, pseudo potential stack again in the valence So they come in as the way you treat the external potential of the ion. So instead of having just a bare Coulomb attraction, you will have a more complicated potential. And so they're typically just sort of table lookups. And so you tell quantum espresso, okay, I want you to use a particular pseudo potential. And quantum espresso says, okay, I'm no longer going to have a bare Coulomb attraction. 
I'm going to look up this file that you've given me that tells me how I should treat the potential in the core region of the of the um, ion. So I believe the potential will stay the same because you're not changing anything about either the nucleus or the core electrons. But of course, it will interact with the valence electrons. So as your density and as your cone sham wave functions evolve, they will still be feeling the same pseudo-potential, but they will be interacting differently with it depending on how they're structured. Does that make sense? So in the same way that you wouldn't expect the bare coulombic um, attraction of a, of a, a nucleus to change, the pseudo-potential is not going to change either, because basically you're just collapsing the core electrons onto the nucleus and giving quantum espresso a fictitious nuclear potential. Okay, so there are various ways of picking pseudo-potentials, and again, there will be a line in our input file that says, okay, quantum espresso, I don't want you to use pseudo-potentials, or okay, quantum espresso, I want to use a particular pseudo-potential, and you can tell it what form to use whether an ultra-soft Vanderbilt or so-called norm-conserving. There are various reasons for picking various pseudo-potentials, and we'll dig into that a little bit as we do the walkthrough together. So that's the second dial we can turn, whether or not we want to use a pseudo-potential, and then how we actually implement the pseudo-potential. Okay, so basis set choice. And so, like we said, um, the way you decide how you're going to decompose your cone sham wave functions, you're not going to represent them analytically. You're going to represent them in some basis set. And so we said for molecules and atoms, typically Gaussians are a nice choice because they're nice and localized. For extended systems, plane waves, such as sines and cosines, are usually a nice choice. And then we said, additionally, if you have a crystal, you're going to have your plane wave supplemented with this sort of translation function that says we don't want the plane waves to behave differently in different unit cells of the crystal, so we need to have this periodic translation. Um, Okay, so why this isn't a true choice for quantum espresso is because you'll remember that, as I said at the very beginning, quantum espresso only uses plane waves. This is not actually something we can control directly. We can't tell quantum espresso to use Gaussians or use Lorentzians. It's intrinsically going to use plane waves. Um, if you are absolutely certain you want to use Gaussians for some reason, you need to pick a different package. So you might pick a different um, calculation package, a different software in order to use this. That's why this one is not a true choice. However, we do have control over how we implement the basis set. So we need to make sure that the basis set is big enough in order to give us convergence. So what do I mean by that? So that's the fourth thing that we control. So this one is not one we really control, though in principle we could. The thing we do control is the size of our basis set. So remember this slide from, from last time and actually the beginning of today's lecture that we said if you're representing uh, your wave function using plane waves, you can generate sort of interference patterns to localize the wave functions on top of the ions. And so the question then becomes, how many wave functions, uh, how many um, components do I need in my basis set? So formally, there's an infinite number of sine waves, all with just different frequencies, right? And so why not just use all of them? Well, we actually want to compute something at the end of the day, so we need to truncate that somewhere. So we can't use every single infinite um, sine wave in the entire world. And so we need to say, well, maybe we only need to worry about a certain subset of that. So how do we know how many to take? So this is sort of similar to what I said before. Imagine we have our crystalline system. So these are the nuclei. So these are the ions. So imagine we had a basis set that only contained these two sine waves. So that's not going to give us high enough resolution in order to localize our wave functions on top of the on top of the ions. Why? Well, because the sort of characteristic wavelength of these sine waves is sort of like this. Let's call it um, this one is L2. Characteristic wavelength of the slower guy is maybe L1. But the characteristic separation between the ions, perhaps we can call that D, is much much smaller than L1 and L2. And so we're never going to be able to do a decent job of representing the wave function over the system using just these two coarse sine waves. So we're never going to be able to generate a nice interference pattern like that because these guys are just too flabby. They're too big. They don't have the sufficient resolution in order to, to localize the wave function in this manner. So then we say, okay, well, let's take more and more. And so let's take higher frequency sine waves, so things like this. 
And so at some point, we need to draw the line and we need to say, when do we have enough? And so we know when we have enough is where, when our answer no longer changes with the number of sine waves we take in our basis set. Does that sort of make sense to everybody? Yes, question. Right, no longer changes, you mean like beyond the certain threshold. Exactly, that's right. And so your, your, the energy that you compute for your system or the um, actual density in three-dimensional space you compute for your system is no longer sensitive to the highest sine waves that you take in your system. So we'll show that in just one second. Um, and so mathematically, the way we write that is that we appreciate that with larger and larger values of G correspond to higher and higher frequency sine waves, just by expanding this complex exponential into its sines and cosines. So this larger G just means higher frequency sine wave. And so typically the way that we talk about um, how many we take is what is the maximum value of G we use in our basis set. So that's just the, the sort of standard DFT nomenclature is what is G max? What is the highest frequency sine wave you need to worry about for representing your wave function? Um, so let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So we're superposing plane waves in order to get interference patterns to represent our orbitals. And so basically we're expanding our cone sham wave functions in these plane waves. And the highest frequency plane wave we take has G max. Okay, so this is just going back again to this horrible, very confusing concept of real versus reciprocal lattices. So we compute these orbitals in the reciprocal space, meaning we go from our real lattice to a reciprocal lattice, so in the Fourier space. Basically, that just means we're operating in this G space. So it's just the values of G that we take. And so how do we know how big to go? And so how do we, how do we determine what G max should be? And so if this is our expansion in the plane waves, this is what a particular plane wave looks like. So we're just picking one guy out of the basis. And from that, we can compute its kinetic energy. So we can just apply our del squared operator, which is in the DFT and quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger equation formalism, tells you the energy of that wave. And it turns out you get this very compact, nice expression. Um, and so what is this saying? Well, modulus, this factor at the front, is basically saying that the bigger your value of G, the more energetic your wave is. And so that makes sense. So higher frequency waves contain more energy than lower frequency waves. And so why is that useful? Well, it provides sort of a very nice handle to us for determining G max, because instead of determining G max directly, we can actually specify the maximum energy that we care about, and that then informs our G max. So typically what folks do in, in a density functional calculation is specify the maximum energy wave they care about, and then quantum espresso goes in and uses this expression to figure out what's the maximum G they should use. So we specify a maximum energy. So, so that's the whole idea here. And so that's known as our cutoff energy. Okay, so hopefully this slide will make everything clear. So again, this is our expansion in plane waves. And so what am I showing you here? I'm showing you the energy as a function of the sort of lattice spacing. And so you can go out more and more and more to larger and larger values of G. And so that would be a wave pointing in this direction. That would be a plane wave pointing in this direction. This would be a plane wave pointing in this direction. And sort of the size of the radius specifies its frequency. And so something like this would be a very slow frequency plane wave sort of pointing upwards. Something like this would be a very high frequency plane wave pointing diagonally. And so we need to figure out, well, what subset of these do we want to generate our interference pattern? And a very clean way of doing that is saying, well, how big is the circle? And the size of the circle is defined by the energy cutoff, because these are higher and higher and higher frequency plane waves, and at some point we say enough is enough, we don't need to worry about any higher frequencies beyond this. So if you remember only one plot from this entire section, it's this one. And so what are we showing here? We're showing the energy we compute for our system. So imagine we're studying the hydrogen molecule, which we're going to do next week. We use VFD to compute the energy of the electrons around the, the two hydrogen ions. And we ask it, we're asking quantum espresso, well, what energy do you compute as a function of my energy cutoff? So way down here, we've only got a very small subset of very flabby, slow, uh, low frequency plane waves. And quantum espresso says your energy is minus uh, 2.255. Then we say, okay, quantum espresso, what about if I include higher frequency plane waves? I get a little bit of a bigger basis set. The energy starts to go down. Quantum espresso is doing a better job of making a, an approximation for the energy. And we know by the variational principle, we're never going to get below the true energy, but we're going to converge down towards it. And so we do a better prediction, a lower energy prediction. 
As we continue to increase ECOT, which is basically just expanding the size of our basis set, we have more and more high frequency waves, we see the energy continues to decrease and then plateaus. So at this point, we've sort of done the best job we possibly can. Um, and what's useful about this plot is it says that when you hit 30, an ECOT of 30 Rydbergs, where Rydbergs is the unit of energy. Uh, if you look back last time, we had what a Rydberg actually is in joules or electron volts, if you care. But basically, we say at 30 Rydbergs, we've converged. We don't need to go all the way up to 50 Rydbergs, which is going to be a much more expensive calculation because our basis set is bigger. So it tells you what's the minimum basis set I can get away with and get a converged result. Does that make sense? This is what I meant by that phrase that any DFT calculation worth its salt is going to have some convergence plot. Because if we did not have this plot, we wouldn't know whether we were converged or not. We wouldn't know whether our basis set was big enough to actually give us a converged answer. I could report to you just this single number here, and you wouldn't know how good that number was, because you, I haven't proven to you that it's actually converged. So that's one of the very important dials we're going to turn, is the cutoff in our basis set. What is the highest frequency sine wave we need to worry about in our flame wave expansion? Any questions about that? Okay, so that's known as convergence with respect to energy cutoff. And we're going to do that in the walkthrough, and we're going to do it in your project. Okay, so the final thing that we can tweak is K-point sampling. And so remember when I told you about there was this uh, um, reciprocal lattice, which is known as the Brillouin zone, and we need to compute the energy of our wave function at every point inside this little chunk of space. And so I said, in real space, we have our fundamental unit cell. We have our crystalline unit cell. In reciprocal space, we have the same thing. And so it looks like something like this. And we said, we need to worry about all these special points inside this uh, reciprocal space because eventually we want to compute our energy and our wave function in, in all of this space. Okay, and so of course we're not going to compute the wave function analytically at sort of every single continuous point that's in the space. We've got to do it numerically. So that means we've got to put down a grid. So we're going to have to compute our wave function at particular discrete points within that grid. So we're not doing math by hand, we're getting the computer to do it for us, which means we need to use a grid solve. And so we need to tell Quantum Espresso where in this sort of um, Brillouin zone, so where in this space, we need to worry about solving for the wave function. So if all we did was solve for the wave function, bang in the middle of this thing, and not worry about it at any other point in space, we'd probably get a pretty bad estimate for our, for our energies, because we've, we've not sort of populated the space with points and solving at every point. So you probably want to put down a whole bunch of k-points all over your space um, and solve for the wave function, the, the density, the energy at all of those points. And so k-point sampling is just basically how dense is your grid over which you're computing the wave function. That's the right way to think about this. And so you want to be dense enough such that your energy is not a function of how dense your grid is. But you don't want to be too dense because the calculations get too expensive needlessly because we're, we're already accurate enough. Um, so we'll show the convergence in, in one second. Uh, well, actually, maybe I'll show it right now. And so it's a very similar plot. And so again, this is the energy of our system, so the energy perhaps of our aluminum lattice as a function of the number of K points that we use in our reciprocal space unit cell. And so if we use too few K points, we're solving over too sparse of a grid. It's just like solving differential equations over a grid or something like that. You get a pretty bad estimate your grid has got to be fine enough such that your answer is no longer sensitive to how dense the grid is. So we have, we have to make sure that our answer is not sensitive to the density of k-points. So there's our two important convergence things we have to do. We have to do the energy cutoff and we have to do the k-points. And provided we're converged with, with respect to both of those things, we can have good faith in the answers we compute from quantum espresso. Um, okay, so any questions about k-points? Yeah. Uh, it is a pretty big difference. So it turns out, depending on what system you have, you can have different sort of characters of this plot. So for some systems, you will see a precipitous drop off, and then it will converge very quickly. It will basically flatline. For other systems, you may see that it will oscillate. For other systems, you may see a longer decay. It really depends on what arrangement of ions you have in your system, uh, what exchange correlation functional you picked, what pseudo potential you picked. It's all intrinsically linked. 
there's no way sort to predict how this will look a priori. We know eventually it will converge, but what it does on the way to convergence is very system dependent. So you're talking about the size of the Right. So you're saying it's only like a 0 0.6 yeah, drop so here. Yes. Yeah, so, so again, that goes back to what what are you interested in? So, so what are you trying to compute? So maybe if all you're interested in is the absolute energy of your system, sort of 0.6 electron volts per atom out of 800 is not a big deal. But if you're computing the energy of this system and comparing it to the energy of another system, so perhaps this is um, a nitrogen molecule and you want to know the energy of the nitrogen molecule, and then you want to know the energy of two infinitely separated nitrogen atoms, those small differences can be very important because you're computing a small error in a very small number. And so in percentage terms, that can be very big. And so maybe this point six could be a big deal um, depending on what question you're asking. Um, okay, and so just one last point, which is gonna be important for uh, the way we actually do our calculations, is, okay, we have our, in real space, we have our crystalline unit cell. It's known as the wigner site cell. That doesn't really matter. It's just the fundamental crystalline unit cell. And in reciprocal space, we have our fundamental unit cell, which is known as the Brion zone. So they're just uh, unit cells in real space and in reciprocal space. So all I want you to remember is there's an inverse relationship between the sizes of these things. And so if your unit cell in real space is really, really big, that means your unit cell in reciprocal space is really, really small. Conversely, if your unit cell in real space is very, very small, it means your unit cell in reciprocal space is very, very big. That's part of the reason why it's called reciprocal space. So why should we care about that? The reason we should care about that, and we'll see this in the walkthrough, is that we can use a smart trick. Okay, so imagine this is real space. Um, and let me draw a reciprocal space in blue. So imagine the thing that we're interested in is an aluminum crystal. Okay, so imagine our crystal looks something like this. So we said it's crystalline, and so we don't need to worry about the whole lattice. We just pick out our fundamental unit cell. And so there are a number of ways of doing that, but you can be pretty smart the way you pick it. And so maybe this is our fundamental unit cell. So this is really small. So it turns out when you have a small unit cell in real space, you get a very large unit cell in reciprocal space. So maybe this is what it looks like for aluminum. Um, because basically there's a one over the lattice constant relationship. So a very small lattice constant here means a very large lattice constant, reciprocal lattice constant here. Okay, so why is that important? Well, this is the space we do our k-point sampling in. So if this is really big, it means we're going to have to put down a large number of k-points in order to do a good job of converging our energies. And so this is going to need a very densely populated k-point grid. So that sort of makes sense. Because if you have a very detailed structure with sort of very closely packed ions and you need to pick a really small unit cell, it means your system is sort of complicated, right? It's sort of very closely packed. There's lots of stuff going on. And so you would anticipate you're going to need to do a better job of populating any sort of grid solver you're going to use. And so that's exactly what we see here. Crystals with very small lattice constants have very small real space unit cells, very large reciprocal space unit cells. You're going to need lots of K points. Okay, so why is that important? Imagine, as we're going to do, we're going to look at a hydrogen molecule. Okay, so this is our hydrogen molecule. So two nuclei there. And so the trick that we play is we put this hydrogen molecule in an enormous real space box. So we put this hydrogen molecule in this gigantic box, basically an infinite box, so it's super huge. What does that do? That means in reciprocal space, 
the hydrogen unit cell is tiny, and we can actually get away with a single k-point. So we can just do one k-point sampling. So that's going to be important, because in your walkthrough, we're actually going to do exactly this, and it's just a, neat, a, a certain neat trick in order to make our calculation run quickly, because we can actually get away with a single k-point. Okay, so, so that's important because you need to know that in order to sort of make sense of your um, k-point convergence. So in order to make make this plot. Okay, are there any questions about that? So if you still don't really understand what reciprocal space is, it doesn't make any sense to you. If you just remember this, you're going to be fine. Okay, so let me summarize, um, and then we'll be done for the day. Um, oh, I do have one more slide after this. Okay, so, so the summary is, what approximations do you control in your quantum espresso run? So you're doing your quantum espresso run. What dials are you going to tweak? What lines are you going to change in your input file? You can pick your exchange correlation functional. We've described various ways of picking that and why you might pick one over another. Um, as we do the walkthrough, we'll describe different pseudo-potentials. So basically, we said, if you have core electrons, pseudo-potentials are probably a good idea because it's going to save you a bunch of CPU cycles. Basic set choice in quantum espresso, we don't actually have a choice. We have to pick plane waves. So in principle, you could use a different package that uses Gaussians. We have to do a basic set energy cutoff, so specifying E cut, which specifies the highest frequency plane wave that we have in our, in our basis set expansion. And we need to make sure our answer is not sensitive to our choice of the cutoff. And then we have our k-point sampling. So we have to make sure our k-point grid in reciprocal space is dense enough such that our answer is no longer dependent on the density of the grid points. Okay, so this is sort of the quick summary, and we're basically going to study all of these things as we, as we do the walkthrough. So hopefully you have an appreciation of what these things mean. Um, as I was designing this course, I thought I could get away with sort of just giving the second of these two lectures, but then you would have no idea what any of these things meant. And so that was why we went through all sort of the painful theory. Uh, hopefully you found it useful, perhaps entertaining. Um, but if all you remember is basically the things that we control and why we control them and how we control them, you're going to be able to do a quantum espresso calculation. Okay, so any questions on any of those? All right, so last thing, um, visualization. As I said, quantum espresso spits out lots of stuff. If you look in at save sub subdirectory, you'll actually find the wave function. Um, and in principle, we're not actually going to do this because the systems we're using are, are sort of super simple. Um, we don't really need to do it. We'll do a lot of visualization when we do molecular dynamics, but actually none here. But I just want to convey to you that, in principle, you can use two software packages, X, Chris, Dan, um, and VMD, in order to actually visualize a couple of things. VMD is really good for visualizing the ion positions. X, Chris, Dan, which I assume stands for sort of X windows crystal density, will actually take in a quantum espresso output file and it will visualize the charge density for you over your system. So if you care about those things, you can make a nice visualization. Why might you want to do that? It's usually a very important part of simulation as a sanity check, and so you have some anticipation before you can do the calculation what answer you should get. You might not know precisely, but you know how it's a short, sort of look. So it's a good sanity check. It can very quickly diagnose errors, and so you can see very quickly if something sort of grossly is going wrong. It gives you a nice overview. Um, it can guide and inform you, and so if you see particular regions where there seems to be some interesting charge density happening, perhaps you know something exciting is happening there, and you can work harder to study this part of the system. And finally, your advisor probably tells you you have to make some nice pictures in order to give a research presentation or write a scientific paper. So um, that can also be a good reason to do visualization. Okay, so that's all I had on the sort of practice of quantum espresso. Um, and so what I propose is that we just finish early today. And so if you're done with your project, uh, feel free to, to leave. Um, I'll stick around until the end of class. If you have any questions about your project, either Bash or MATLAB or the quiz. And starting Tuesday next week, we'll actually get to doing some, some hands-on running of quantum espresso, so do a DFT calculation for the hydrogen molecule. If you want to jump ahead, that stuff's all posted. If you want to install quantum espresso, I provided some instructions for you. Uh, so do go ahead and do that. But otherwise, uh, next Tuesday in class, we'll start running quantum special on these machines. Okay, thanks, folks. Have a good weekend.